And good evening, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, friends, Romans, and countrymen. And we need both your ears one more time. Once again tonight, we have with us tonight JT and Terry Lee Clark. They are here from the Ministry of My Brother's Crossings, and you're going to hear about that in just a few minutes. But here's what we want you to do while you're coming in. We'll give it, give, uh, give it some time for people to come in and get situated. We want you to uh, share it out. I mean, push it out there. Get it into your news feed. Uh, we're relying on you. We really are. We're relying on you to push this thing out there uh, near, far, and wide. And so whether you're down the street, around the corner, across America, or somewhere around this great big world, we're asking you to help us reach people. And it's so very, very important. We need your help. Don't we, Ed? Sure do. <laughs> Ask him a question. He answers it, and he don't say no more. That's all right. Hey, focus. That's all right. Ed, all the time messing with me. But anyhow, uh, <laughs> come in and leave your comments. There's, there's the missus. Good evening. I got to say good evening, Mom. Aren't you uh -huh. supposed to say better half? That well, <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. It's the better half, but she's beyond that. You know what I'm saying? Oh, okay. Yeah, that's good clean up there, George. Yeah, I, I, I gotta, I'm gonna get Zacchaeus up a tree and won't get him back down again. Yeah, that's right. So, uh, thanks, Ed. <clears throat> but that, that's all right. And here was her reply to you, Ed. Go, Ed. Uh, <laughs> She loves it. She loves it. One one night, I think last week, JT and I was talking. And I got Zacchaeus up a tree and couldn't get him back down. And, and she hasn't let me forget it. If I live to be 100, she lives to be 100. She'll never forget it, that's for sure. And she'll, she'll remind me. Here's Cheryl. Hi, Cheryl. It's good to see you. Uh, share us out, Cheryl. Push us out there. Uh, everywhere, everywhere that you can possibly think of. And so here's what we're going to do tonight. From brokenness to forgiveness. Yeah. What a tremendous, tremendous true life event that took place in August of 2015. And what was born out of that tragedy Wow. A ministry, a ministry was born out of that tragedy that is reaching far and wide. And I would venture to say that it's going to reach around the world before it's all said and done. It's going to reach people. And so we're going to share, or JT and I, Dustin, JT and Terry Lee is going to share with us tonight how this ministry was born and they're going to share with us the nuts and the bolts this is i call it a boots on the ground ministry where they minister who they minister to and all those other things that makes this ministry possible and uh it's a tremendous tremendous story here's somebody Miss Tammy. Yes, Tammy. Yes, she's a big supporter, as is Dustin. Yeah. Uh, we appreciate y'all being with us tonight. Yeah, thank you, guys. Share us out there. Share us out there. JT, we're going to let you guys take it away and just tell us how this ministry was born out of a tragedy. Yeah, uh, George, uh, Ed, thank you all so much for having Terry Lee and me with you all tonight. Uh, we first met uh, 20, 20 months ago or thereabouts, 21 months ago. Uh, I got an email from Ed and saying, hey, would you consider coming on uh, the show with George Espenlob? And, and uh, we, we had that opportunity. And then uh, that was followed up by two visits to uh, Ed's church there in Ohio. 
And uh, and recently, George, you've come on board with us to help us produce our radio show. And, and uh, we'll talk about that more in a little bit. But uh, uh, as you mentioned, this uh, ministry of My Brother's Crossing was absolutely born of a tragedy. Uh, uh, on a Friday night in August of uh, 2015, my brother and his wife, uh, who I would describe as disciples of Christ, they lived to serve God. Uh, they had traveled from one county in Southwest Virginia to another county to go to a church service at a biker church called Trash Ministry. Mm -hmm. Trash stands for Totally Redeemed Anointed Servants of the Most High. And the night that they traveled to that church to go to that service on that Friday night, I left the county where we live and I traveled to the same county. I went there to volunteer at a high school football game. Uh, the night of this accident, my brother and I were two miles apart the whole night. I did not know he was there. He did not know I was there. Uh, the second half of the football game I was volunteering at, I was a member of the chain crew. I was responsible to keep track of the downs. And in the second half of that football game, an ambulance parked at the stadium in case somebody got hurt. The ambulance had to leave. And a short distance from the stadium, uh, the ambulance, uh, an ambulance had developed a mechanical problem, overheated. It caught fire and burn up from the stadium. We could see the column of smoke. We could hear the oxygen cylinders as they exploded in the heat of the fire. Well, by the time the game ended, they had extinguished the fire, but the road remained closed while they cleaned up and investigated. And when I left the stadium that night, I turned a direction opposite of where the ambulance had burned. I went to the main road, made my way home. I didn't have any problem. But there was a man attending the same football game I was volunteering at. He was there with his 15-year-old son. And when he left the stadium that night, he turned in a direction of where the ambulance had burned because he lived, him and his son lived that way. And as they approached the scene of, of this incident with the ambulance, they were put on a detour and, and uh, to be routed around the incident. And the road they were detoured to happened to be the road that my brother was leading a small group of bikers back to their home in the county where they lived. And when this man reached the intersection with that road, he accidentally turned into the wrong travel lane. He was left at the double yellow lines when he made his left hand turn and, and he was coming head on at my brother. And the witnesses on the motorcycles behind my brother said they tried to avoid each other, uh, but it happened so fast and my brother's motorcycle skidded off in the grass and never hit the truck, never touched the truck. But my brother and his wife were thrown to the asphalt in front of the truck. And the truck ran them over, crushing and killing them. Word traveled back to the biker church that one of their own was down. And the pastor of that church, his name is Mike Price. He had trained with my brother as a pastor. They were in ministry together on some level. And, and Mike would later tell me that when they got word that one of their own was down, they didn't know who was involved or how bad it was or if there was anything they could do. But he's told me two dozen of us filled with emotion, poured out from our church and went the mile and a half to the scene of the wreck. And when they got there, they quickly learned that it was my brother and his wife who'd been killed. There wasn't anything they could do for him. They turned their attention on the man driving the truck. Now, Mike Price likes to say, we're not motorcycle enthusiasts, we're bikers. Long hair, tattoo covered, leather vest wearing, Bible carrying, Jesus loving bikers. But to look at the outward appearance, you wouldn't necessarily think they were from a church. And, and there, this man and his son are devastated by what's happened. They're on a rural stretch of roadway in Southwest Virginia, and they see this group of bikers pull up. And this man and his son happen to be black. And they look up and see these bikers in their grip of fear. What's about to happen to us? In 2014, 2015, we're talking about things like Ferguson, Missouri, Baltimore, Maryland, the church shooting in South Carolina. And this group of bikers makes their way into the accident scene. They reach this man and his son. And they encircle him. And they lay hands on him and begin to pray for him, praying that this 15-year-old boy would not be harmed by what he experienced. And praying that the driver of the truck would be lifted and protected from his involvement in the accident. One of the EMS workers that's there to take care of my brother, there wasn't anything he could do for him, but he witnessed what was taking place. And he went up to the pastor of the biker church and says, I want to know the God you serve. And accepted Jesus Christ as a savior in the midst of all that was going on. It is evidence of lives lived well when you're positively impacting others. 
even through your passing. And I'm here to tell you, my brother and his wife lived well. On Sunday morning, just hours after this accident happened, late Friday night, early Saturday morning, this man driving the truck is in his living room, devastated by what has happened. And his wife is just begging for him. Let's get up. Let's take a walk. Let's get some air. And he's too devastated to even get out of his chair. And he would later describe to me that the phone rang. And when they answered the telephone, it was my brother's daughter. My brother's daughter was calling to tell this man that she understood it was an accident. And as a family, we were going to move on a path of forgiveness. She was calling to tell this man she didn't know, had never seen, never laid eyes on to tell him that she loved him and she forgave him. Now, George, that phone call did not take place months later or weeks later, within hours of losing both parents. She made that phone call in spite of how she felt. Being devastated by the news herself, she still made that phone call. And CJ Martin, the driver of the truck, would later tell me that getting that phone call in that moment helped him to get to the next day. The next day, my mom shared with me that she had received a letter that my brother had written to her on the morning of the day of the accident. And she told me that in that letter that he wrote to her, he told her how much he loved her, how good a mom she had been to us six kids how he had allowed life circumstances to interfere with his visitation and how much he was looking forward to coming up to visit her on her birthday. All I could utter was what a treasure. His last thoughts were of you. You know exactly how he felt about you. And I began to reflect the difference in the way my brother lived his life and how I lived my life. You see, you didn't part company with my brother without him letting you know you matter to him, that he appreciated you, that he loves you. I was asked to speak on behalf of the family at the funeral that was held one week to the day after the accident. And that day after the, the services concluded at the graveside, our family retreated back to comfort and console one another. But the men and women from Trash Ministry had other ideas. They wanted to go back to the scene of the accident. They wanted to place a couple of roadside markers in remembrance of my brother and his wife. They wanted to speak prayers for our family. But a detail I haven't shared with you to this point, that the man driving the truck is also a pastor. In fact, from the front door of his church, you can see the football stadium where we had been at that night. You can see the scene of the ambulance fire. In fact, you can see the scene of the accident. You can wrap your arms around this whole thing. And not only did Trash Ministry show up that night for that vigil, CJ's church showed up that night. Let that image sink in your mind for just a minute. And there they are praying for our family and praying for his family and praying for his church and his ministry. They're praying for our community. But it didn't end with prayer. You see the men and women from Trash Ministry prepared food and gave money to the Martin family to help to sustain them in the days and weeks after the accident. That's love in action. We're called to pray and prayer has to be a foundational part, a cornerstone of our faith walk. But we've got to be willing to roll up our sleeves and step into somebody else's situation. And that's what the men and women from Trash Ministry yeah. did that night. And C.J. Martin, he was charged in the accident. And he was to appear in court some two months after the accident. And about five days before he was to go to court, I got a stirring in me that I needed to be there. I did not want to go. Our family was moving on a path of forgiveness and I was afraid if I showed up in that courtroom, I would not be able to hold it together and maybe the judge would make it worse on it. In fact, the day of his hearing, I left my home. We live in Boones Mill, Virginia, and I drove to the city just to our North Roanoke, to Virginia, to my job. By nine o'clock that morning, I was at my desk getting myself ready for the week. And by 10 o'clock, the feeling that I needed to be in that courtroom was so strong, I had to get in my car and make the hour drive south. In my mind, the only reason I was going to court that day was somebody needed to be in the courtroom to represent my brother and his wife. That was my motivation. And as I got in the car to make the drive south, I got about two thirds of the way there and a message came across my spirit. I need you to pay the fine. Pay the fine? 
what do you mean I need to pay the fine? My wife doesn't know where I'm going. My family, this could be thousands of dollars. And the very next message was, you don't worry about a thing. You show up, be ready to pay the fine and I'll make a way. Now, my brother had lived out his faith in front of me. My wife of 28 years had lived out her faith in front of me. They had both shared experiences of hearing things on their spirit. I did not know what they meant. I did not live this way. And here I was faced with this. And what was I going to do? I arrived at the courthouse. I was about two hours early. And I went inside the courtroom and I grabbed a seat about four rows back from the front. And I'm just trying to process what has happened. And as I'm sitting there, I'm thinking, OK, we're going to watch this thing play out. Whatever happens, I'm going to go to the clerk. I'll write the check and I'll use my drive home to figure out how to explain to my wife what I've done. <laughs> We've been married for 28 years. I wanted to get to 29. <laughs> the truth of the matter is we didn't have that kind of money. And all I could think is, what am I going to have to sell to make good on this check I'm getting ready to write? And as I'm sitting there waiting for this two hours to pass, the third message came. I need you to tell the state trooper who you are and why you're here. There were three state troopers standing in front of the courtroom. There was no activity going on. I did not know which of the three investigating. And all I could think is not my idea to be here. It's not my idea to pay the fine. If I go tell these guys what's happened, they're going to lock me up. <laughs> and I finally got the courage and I went and stood against the wall a few feet away from where the three of them were talking and I eavesdropped on their conversation. And as I listened to them, I figured out which of the three investigated and I went over to the trooper and I said, sir, my name is JT Clark. I'm the brother and brother-in-law, the two that were killed. I wasn't subpoenaed to be here. I wasn't invited. I don't have a role. But I came to pay the fine. He looked back at me like I was from a different planet. And he turned and picked up his investigation folder and he walked me back over to where I'd been seated. He sat down next to me. He leaned into me and he said, now, what did you just say to me? I said, I came to pay the fine. He said, I've been doing this 37 years. I've never heard anything like this in my entire career. And he opened up that folder and proceeded to walk me through his investigation. He showed me his written report. He showed me those accident scene photographs. And he gave me an explanation of everything he found that night. He said, when I showed this evidence to the prosecuting attorney, that the attorney was considered vehicular manslaughter charges against Mr. Martin. And I gasped. And this is an important part of the story. The trooper goes on to tell me that when he came in him with vehicular manslaughter, he said, every case I've ever investigated, the family wants more penalty, not less. He said, but when he approached me about vehicular man, he said, something moved in me. And he said, I pushed back and I told him not here, not in this case. And instead of being charged with vehicular manslaughter, he was charged with reckless driving. That's a big difference. He went on to tell me that just a couple of years before he had lost his own son in a, in a motor vehicle crash. He said, I'm still struggling to deal with the circumstances of that. And you walk in here and you're going to pay a man's fine. And he got up and he walked away from me, shaking his head in disbelief. The balance of the time passes. The judge enters the courtroom and he calls the case. And for the first time, I see who C.J. Martin is. He comes forward with his attorney, the Commonwealth's attorney and the state trooper, all four of them standing before the judge. Before the judge uttered a word, the trooper looked over his left shoulder, pointed a finger in my direction and said, you're a part of this now, too. You better come on up here. I was shaking in my shoes. My family does not know I'm there. Now I'm standing before the judge. The defense attorney says, your honor, we're prepared to accept a plea deal for improper driving. And the judge looks back at him, improper driving. I've got two dead people here. Somebody's going to have to explain something to me. And he swears us in. He asked the trooper to give an account. Well, the trooper told the judge the very same story he had shared with me a short time before, showed him the same reports, the same photographs. And when he got to the end, he says, Your Honor, there's two more things you need to know. This is J.T. Clark. He's the brother and brother-in-law of the two that were killed. And his sole purpose of being here today is to pay any fine you impose in this case. When C.J. Martin heard that, he cried out in the courtroom, Oh, my Jesus. And he started bawling. Months later, he would tell me that when he came into the courtroom that day, he saw the trooper sitting and talking to me. He said, when the trooper called for me to come forward, he said, I just knew you were there to be a witness against me. 
And when I heard what you were there to do, he said, I couldn't contain it. I cried out to my savior. The judge turned his head and looked at me and said, what in the world would you do that for? Now I had to say something. <laughs> well, your honor, our family's moving on a path of forgiveness toward Mr. Martin. And frankly, actions speak louder than words. If my being here paying his fine helps him to accept and receive the forgiveness my family's extended so that he can do what he's called to do, enjoy the rest of his life, enjoy his wife and son. Your Honor, that's what I'm here to do. We love Mr. Martin. The judge reached over, picked up a piece of paper. He says, a few minutes ago, I'm trying to figure out how I can accept a charge of improper driving. And now I'm writing on this piece of paper that the fine is $5. With the case adjudicated, I walked over to C.J. Martin and I grabbed him up in a bear hug. I said, I got you, brother. It's going to be all right. And as we went to pay the fine, CJ grabbed me by the shoulder, shook my hand and said, how is your mom doing? And then she asked me how my brother's daughter was doing, Robin. And then he said this, that really set things in motion. He said, won't you come to my church? A man who had not been to church in years, wanted no part of it, had rejected the very things his my wife had been walking out in front of me. I'm now faced with the prospect of going to the church pastor by the man involved in his accident within sight of the scene of the accident. And amazing things have, have come out of this, George. Uh, and just incredible things have come out since that day. I mean, I'm going all the way back to the accident, but, but from that day forward, really, uh, circumstances, my whole life is, my whole life is different. I've been transformed and I'm continuing to be, transformed as we go. Terry Lee, it was a long time coming. <laughs> yes, it was. But, uh, you know, you have to say well worth the wait. <laughs> well worth the wait. You know, no matter how long it was, God I, brought him there. As I sit and listen, I'm reminded his ways are not our ways. Mm. His thoughts are not our thoughts. <clears throat> and in the natural, hmm. and as the world looks at things, you can't you can't wrap your head around this. Mm -mm. And and if it was just if it was just what happened over the course of those two months, that's but it just keeps. At the day my brother was killed, he, he didn't write just one letter to our mother. He wrote a letter to an, a man who was incarcerated that he ministered to, and he wrote a letter to his son. And part of the message to his son was, if I could give my life for one. He wrote that the day he was killed. If I could give my life for one. And we don't have to look too far. Mm -hmm. the, the EMS worker that's on the scene of the accident accepts Jesus Christ as a savior in the midst of that going on. My whole life has been transformed. I am not who I was. Uh, I I live I live for Christ. Uh, I'm a disciple. I, I, I'm a disciple. Um, when I had no desire, I had, I used to make fun of people that live this way, and and so it's um you know it's just overwhelming. And and when you know we talked right before the show about why me? Well, who am I? that that you could use me uh and uh it's just it's just something people want to know well what's your relationship with cj martin like these days <laughs> uh he's our pastor uh i'm now ordained as a minister in his church uh we're family uh we do things together we have meals together we we celebrate life together and uh just to see uh, we attend i mean him and his wife were at our youngest daughter's wedding back in May. Uh, we were at his son's graduation uh, from high school. I mean, we're, we're just part of one another's lives. This is not just, as I say it, we were bound into a covenant relationship that day in court. And uh, our, our lives are uh, 
you know, CJ will make the comment, and I know you're going to have him on in a couple of weeks or, or in some time in the future, but he'll make the comment that me being in court and the things that our family helped to, to rescue him, to save his life. But here's the flip side of that. I, I've received far more from CJ Martin than I ever gave to him. Let that sink in for just a minute. <laughs> and you'll not find any finer man on this planet than C.J. Martin. Yeah. He's no a, argument from me, yeah, that's for sure. That's he's, he's a delight yeah. to talk to. Yeah. He's a delight to listen to a minister. Mm-hmm. He's a prince of a man. Yes. And he, he's just, uh, he, he's the real deal. That That's all there is to it. Ed, you got anything to, to ask? Well, actually, I wanted to add, uh, going back to the, the book, um, and what's the name of the book? In the Blink of an Eye. Yeah, I should know. I bought it. Actually, I, I read <laughs> it cover to cover. Uh, and, and to be quite honest with you, um, it is one of the, I don't know, one of us might be an uh, understatement. It may be the easiest book to read that you ever read. And it, uh, you know, it, it, uh, it reads as if uh, JT and Terry Lee are talking to you. It's a conversation. And it's, uh, mm-hmm. boy, is it, uh, it, it's, let's put it this way. When I, I received it just hours before the first time JT and Terry Lee came on the show mm-hmm. and, uh, and I had finished it up. I just got it just hours before, and I finished that sucker up right before the show started. So it uh, that that gives you an indication how good of a read it is. And uh, as scatterbrained as I am, I, I usually have to uh, take a couple of days to read something just because I'm going to go on to something else. But you can't, you couldn't take your hands off of it. But I, but I, what I wanted to talk about uh, briefly was, you know, so the the book. Everybody should pick up the book. Everybody should pick up the DVD. Uh, the the movie obviously is good enough where. Uh, if you look at actual reviews, very good reviews, ends up on Pure Flix. It's on a DVD. But what you know, what people need to understand is what you've, how you have had to literally, uh, I don't want to say the word, upend your lives, but you, you literally stopped your livelihoods to to answer God's calling. Can you respond to that? Yeah, I mean, again, I didn't, I didn't understand. I mean, I didn't go into this having researched everything I needed to know about it. I mean, it's just, uh, it's just been a complete, I don't even want to say 180 degree turnaround. I mean, this has been like 540. I mean, it's been (laughs) spun around a couple of times to get going in this direction. But uh, this, we operate this ministry, My Brother's Crossing. It's been a full-time, it's been full-time work for us since uh, May of 2019. Uh, from from the point of the accident to 2019, it was it was part time. I continued full time. Um, I was making uh, eighty to one hundred thousand dollars a year at that point. And um, in May of 2018, I heard clearly on my spirit, "This is not for you. Prepare yourself." And 365 days later, I was faced with a, a choice to uh, leave the work that I was doing and go into ministry full time, or just continue to do it part time. And I knew. I knew what I was called to do. And uh, it, it, I, I wish I could tell you, I just have this bold faith and I don't worry and I don't, uh, mm-hmm. I, I don't have trepidation about things, but uh, yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, and I'll let Terry Lee uh, chime in here because I mean, it, here, here's a, a marriage and now she's had this great faith all these years. And now I'm coming to her saying, uh, here we go full time, sweetheart. It's exciting. I mean, this is something I could have never seen coming. I said before, I mean, this was the life I lived. I was in Bible studies three days a week, teaching Bible studies. This was, this was nothing I thought we would ever do together running a ministry. That wasn't, that wasn't on a list of a hundred things. I was just trying to get him to the cross. <laughs> really? I mean, let's just get him to the cross. Let him have eternal life. That's what I want for him. I want a relationship with Jesus Christ for him. Never thinking we were going to go out and be disciples of Christ together. No. Well, can I ask a husband you this? and wife team? You, you, um, 
you guys both obviously uh I, a while back about a year ago i think i asked jt I said, you know you get to share your testimony which i've only shared my testimony probably a handful of well, i don't want to say that. I don't know. it hasn't been every day that's for sure so you are pretty much saying the testimony continues you know that things continue to happen so one thing i thought about was the car situation can you talk about a little bit about your you know how god has worked through uh your situation with the automobile i know it's been a struggle yeah so uh it continues to be. It, yeah i mean we drive about a thousand miles a week uh we get invited uh to go places we have some standing ministry opportunities that we engage in every week and it just we're on the road all the time we, we don't have a church that we pastor we don't have a church that we minister at uh, on a daily basis, like, like full-time pastors do, uh, our, our sanctuary in a lot of times is our car. And that's, uh, and, and so with that, we put a lot of miles on our vehicle and, and the wear and tear. I mean, a lot of, a lot of calamities with that. Well, we were in a situation in, um, in September of last year where we didn't have wheels to go. Our sandals, <laughs> our sandals were broken. <laughs> And um, uh, a couple who I, I will confess we did not know personally, uh, they had heard our testimony at a service where we had spoke back in 2016. Follow us on our Facebook uh, activity, our social media activity, and learned of our vehicle trouble. And on um, Monday, September 27th last year, about six o'clock in the evening, I get a message from them saying, uh, the Lord is leading us to give you a car. And uh, as it turns out, the vehicle is a 2007 Cadillac DTS. It belonged to the, the wife's father who had passed in January of, of 2021. And they were looking to sell it. And, uh, and they, they said they felt convicted to help us out. Uh, and they said, come on down and pick up the keys. The vehicle is yours. And so they trans we transferred the title. We went through all of that. And um, the vehicle that used to be driven about 7,000 miles a year has been driven 10,000 miles in the last three and a half months. Um, so, uh, and that's just one example of how God has provided uh, for us through the obedience of, of people that are, have been called to help us out. And it, it really is uh, humbling uh, my pride gets in the way at times. Pastor CJ has reminded me uh, as recently as December that uh, you you can't be so prideful to think you're the only one that can do something for somebody. You've got to be open to allowing people to do things for you all as well. And uh, and again, that was that was humbling to hear him tell me that my pride got in the way. And uh, yeah. so that's right now our only vehicle on the road is this 2007 Cadillac that was given to us back in September. And we're so thankful for it because it allows us to go the places that God has called us to do, uh, called us to go. And, um, and we're just thankful for those opportunities. Our, our, our church has been a, on a, I think it's a seven or eight week uh, uh, court. The whole Nazarene uh, denomination is doing a, Prevent, you know, grace, provenial grace, sustaining yeah. grace, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, so, what you're, uh, so obviously you have provenial grace and you had uh, sustaining grace. Mm -hmm. And so, right now, you, you, the issue is with the car and so on and so forth. But can you talk about some of the uh, things that uh, that you see where God still works works on you, works with you, works through you? <laughs> Uh, you know, it feels it, it feels like something fresh every day. Um, I was communicating with a man in Cleveland, Ohio last night, and he was talking about the uh, the circumstances where I call them God incidents. We, we call them God incidents because we don't believe in coincidence. Mm -hmm. The circumstances that unfold, um, like I said, nearly a daily basis. Uh, there have been people that have challenged me to write the follow-up book, um, humble in the jungle or, uh, my brother's crossing a journey continues or, um, because these God incidents unfold and, and it's remarkable. Any one of them you might dismiss and think, well, that's no big deal. But when you see the string of them and how they connect one to another, going back, um, 
going back even even years from the first encounter of that uh, circumstance to the, to the last. It's it's just it's I don't know if I answered your question, but it's just been unbelievable. I say um, it's miraculous. It's nothing but a move of God. JT, tell us where you minister and whom you minister to. Well, the easy answer to that, uh, which is often the most challenging thing, is we say we will go where God says go. We will speak what God says speak and we will do what God says do. And that has taken us into some places that I haven't been the most comfortable. Some of the things that have challenged us the most. Um, and and it includes uh, going into prisons and jails, uh, addiction centers. Uh, you know, we can elaborate on, on those types of things. We get invited to speak in many different environments. Uh, a lot of invitations to churches and organizations. Uh, uh, to come share the testimony of it, uh, to to even go into some of, uh, we get follow-up visits to churches and ask to expound on some of the things that are happening. And uh, each of those encounters is is overwhelming and humbling. Yeah, we, uh, we serve as chaplains for our local public safety agency. Uh, we take a 24-hour shift and, and we respond to crises that families in our communities are experiencing, whether their home is burned down or somebody's passed away or, or, or going through an overdose or whatever it might be to minister to the family or connect them to community resources if they don't want the, the, the spiritual aspect of that. Um, you know, and we, we, as you mentioned earlier, we have a radio show that we were asked to, uh, we were asked to pr put together a half hour segment every Sunday morning. And uh, that came from an, a joint interview me and Terry Lee and, and CJ and his wife did uh, in November of 2020. And the owner of the station heard the interview and, and came to us uh, through the general manager and said, would y'all would y'all do a weekly show and just share what's going on in your ministry and what's going on in your lives, how God's using you. And, and so we do that uh, on some segment. And George, you just came on board this year to help us. Uh, produce that. And, uh, you know, it's just, uh, and again, just uh, overwhelming uh, to see how I, I wasn't in church six years ago. <laughs> I made fun of people who went to church. Um, it's not that I didn't believe in God. I just didn't. I thought I was too far gone. I thought I was damaged goods. And, and the times that I tried God, uh, it didn't work out so well for me. And so I just kind of distanced myself from it and said, you, you have your faith the way you want. And I'll enjoy my Sundays watching football and NASCAR. So, well, I can tell you this. I, I'm not one to watch movies more than once. And I think I've seen the movie. Mm. I think I'm going on four or five times so far. Um, I need to get some more copies of the book so I can hand them out. But, um, mm. In terms of uh, never gets old, always get something um, out of it. Every, you know, it's kind of like reading the Bible. You know, you, you get something out of something different out of it every time you read it, or in this case, watch and listen to it. And uh, there's it's no it's no wonder uh, that that uh, when you look at literal, I mean, you know, reviews, you know, actual reviews, it does very well. Look at Amazon; the reviews is are unbelievable there. And, uh, and I've, I've been on the other end of reviews, at least at one point. So I, I understand where they can go. So that's uh, that's really, really uh, a testimony to, uh, you know, Amazon, no offense to Amazon, but it's it's not exactly a, uh, a pro-Christian, uh, you know, uh, avenue to go to. And uh, for, for you to get uh, positive reviews on both the book and on the on, uh, on, on the movie itself is is an unbelievable testimony in itself. Well, I think, you know, the, the key there and all, all glory to God uh, in everything that we do, we all, the whole point is to point people to Christ and, and we want to uh, glorify him. And, and when it came to making the movie, the movie's called My Brother's Crossing. It was named after our ministry because the book in the blink of an eye, Forgiveness in Black and White, the book title had been used for a Dale Earnhardt movie just shortly before ours was produced. And, and so, um, 
my brother's crossing, uh, 90% of what you see in the film accurately portrays the real events that unfolded. We wanted to be authentic in everything that we've done. We wanted to be authentic with our faith. We want to be authentic with our teaching. We want to be authentic in what we speak and how we minister to people. And we wanted that to be true with the movie. Uh, this is not uh, something that was fabricated. This is not something that, you know, we, we dreamed up to, to, if this was not a true story, it, it's compelling, but the fact that it is a true story and that it's told the way that it's told, we filmed it in the very places where the story unfolded, the same stretch of roadway where my brother and his wife were killed, uh, the same funeral home, the same courtroom that where the case was heard, the same cemetery, the same churches, as authentically as we could tell the story all the way down to the fact that the actor who portrays the state trooper, the actor wears the state trooper's uniform that he wore the night he investigated the accident. Mm. Uh, the actor who portrays me, wears my shirts, wears my wedding band, wears my eyeglasses. The actress who portrays Terry Lee wore her EMS uniform. And, yeah. uh, you know, it, 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 as authentically as we could tell it, uh, and the whole point is to point people to Christ and to glorify God. That's our whole, that's been our whole motive for doing any of it. Let's take people to the, to the trailer and they can see, let me find it here. You know, that's been long. Sometimes he blows stuff up, but nonetheless, <clears throat> This is the trailer, <clears throat> excuse me, this is the trailer to My Brother's Crossing. And here we go. On and on. I'm afraid to drive. I'm J.T. Clark. Well, it's good to know you, Mr. Clark. My condolences to you. I feel like at any moment somebody's going to be down. You're going to have to develop personal relationship with our Savior, Jesus Christ. Dad. Lord, lift me up. Till I'm in pain, Dad. Haven't I served you? Why are you doing this to me? She's adamant about seeking a vehicle of manslaughter charge against Miss Martin. Maybe everybody knows. Tell that to the deceased, to their families, to my son. Forgive him. I want the guy prosecuted. I think you mean persecuted. That's just the way you go. Oh. In theaters. Wow. And ladies and gentlemen, that is available. That DVD is available. Let me go back up here again and I'll get us over here to where you can go i think it's scrolling across the bottom of the screen <clears throat> mybrotherscrossing.org that's the website if you go to mybrotherscrossing.org and just scroll across or go across the top and hit shop there you can see the book in the blink of an eye you can see my brother's crossing the dvd and you can see the combo, which is the book and the DVD, <clears throat> excuse me, and the prices. And you can read the reviews about the book. Uh, and Ed mentioned the reviews on uh, Amazon. I, I have a whole list here on my phone that JT has sent me, and I haven't been able to put them up on the website just yet, but we'll get them up there. Uh, I mean, tremendous reviews about this movie so there go to shop go to mybrotherscrossing.org go to shop and get you a copy of the book or the dvd or both of them the book and the dvd and while you're there go through this website because there's uh the trailer that we just showed you of course is on there uh there's interviews of where they have uh, been, their prison ministry. And let me say this, and I'll, and I'll say it quickly and we'll move on. There is a Donate Now button on there. 
And if the Lord lays it on your heart to donate to this ministry, please do so. Please do so. Uh, it's not about them. It's all about Christ and what he's done for each and every one of us. There, uh, on their website, if you go where it says more, you can go to the radio program that airs on, uh, yeah, let me, what, what is it, W-Y-T-I, J-T, is that the? That's uh, right, that's uh, right. Uh, that airs every Sunday morning at 1030, and then after it airs uh, on the radio station, we put it up on other places, and it is on their website, so you can listen to it. And uh, there's a whole lot to see on that website. But if you're interested in getting the book, the movie, or the book and the movie, go to mybrotherscrossing.org, and uh, you'll you'll be glad that you'll be glad that you did. Certainly, you'll be glad that you did about the DVDs. You have them in your hand. <clears throat> there they are. They came yesterday. They yeah, play? they, they arrived. The first thousand copies arrived yesterday, and this has been something we've been working on for some time. Uh, there is uh, English and Spanish language subtitles, and there's also um, bonus footage that we were asked to record to include on the DVD that gives uh, the backstory on some of this uh, that, that helps to complement the movie, if you will. And, and so if uh, somebody doesn't have Facebook or can't see this interview uh, at a future time, that a lot of what we've talked about is on there. And, uh, you know, it's just the, the movie um, where actually uh, was nominated at a film festival in Dallas in six categories. Uh, the, the festival is uh, announcing those awards coming up in March. Uh, it's under consideration at another Christian film festival in Orlando in May. We haven't heard anything on that yet, but uh, again, it's, it's all, uh, it's all about pointing people to him. It's not about us. You, you said it, you, you said it earlier. It's not, it's not about me. And that's a key message in the film because as I was trying to understand what had happened in the courtroom that day, I approached the only other pastor that I really knew besides my brother and told him what had happened. And, and when I told him, he's like, just remember this, it's not about you. It's not about you. And it really began to force my perspective and force me to ch challenge me. That's a better way to say it. It challenged me to really think about the fact that it wasn't my idea to go to court that day. It wasn't my idea to pay the fine. It wasn't my idea to live this way. And, and uh, it's something else was at work in all of this. And it's the very thing that my wife had lived out in front of me and that my brother had tried to talk to me about. Uh, and it's the very thing that I live for now. It's, it's, it's all about Jesus. And, you know, I know we haven't talked a lot about it. We've got a few more minutes left. Terry Lee and what she did in walking out of her faith in front of me, uh, I think is, is part of the, the message that's so powerful uh, that, that, that should be shared. And maybe if you talk to her a little bit about, I know you tried a minute ago, but uh, uh Talk to Terry Lee about that that walk for those twenty eight years of our marriage. That must have been excruciating. <laughs> oh goodness! Oh, I say excruciating. I will just say, you know, God gave me the strength to go through for those twenty eight years. I couldn't have done it on my own. There's no way with three small children, I could have pushed my way through without a strong faith in God. What were you dealing with in those 28 years? <laughs> well, I was dealing with JT was suffering from depression and suicidal ideation. Um, just two weeks after the birth of our first child, his depression and suicidal ideation sunk, sunk to such a point that he had to be hospitalized. So here we have a two week old baby and now he's being hospitalized. So he spent the first month, basically um, mm -hmm. of six weeks of our life, basically hospitalized, came home before Christmas. And I knew it was too soon. Put him back in the hospital a few days later. He was back for a month, came out, was doing an outpatient program. 
and had a suicide attempt. And in the hospital that morning, the doctor was a friend and he came to me and he showed me the lab results. And he said, well, he's done it this time. He's gotten his wish. And I said, oh, no, he hadn't. God makes the final decision on this. And I went to the prayer chain for our church and said, push it out to all the churches in the county that I was in part of a community Bible study with, get everybody praying. And I spent the first 30 hours in the ICU, wouldn't leave, just laying hands on him, praying for him, for God, begging him to heal him, to touch him and heal him because only he could do it. And on the 30th hour, the doctor came in and he said, you're not going to believe this. And I said, what? And he said, the lab results are turned around. His liver is functioning. And the doctor admitted this was nothing but a miracle from God. This is nothing they did because they had exhausted everything. This was just going to be a matter of time. I'd pushed them to get our liver transplant and they were like, it's too late. It's too late. But with God, it's never, it's never too late. It's never too late. He could decide. And well, he did. And, and, you know, it was uh 19, uh, excuse me, 2009. Yeah. So that happened in 93. It was another 16 years before I came to this idea of forgiveness. Yeah. And I had to move in forgiveness uh, relating to a childhood trauma. Uh, and it was when I did that, that the depression and suicide left me. Um, and people asked then why I didn't go run into church when I did that. And it was my idea or mindset that I, I had already done my time. <laughs> I, I just wanted to enjoy what I had left with my daughters and my wife. Uh, and it was another six years before my brother would be killed. And, and, uh, and I was asked to step by God, asked to step deeper in forgiveness. And the one thing I'll say about forgiveness it is a choice. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it is not always comfortable. It's not always what we feel like doing. Mm -hmm. Just as my niece made that call to CJ hours after losing both parents, uh, she was hurting from the loss of her parents, but she forgave anyway. When we choose forgiveness, when we choose forgiveness and when we allow God to intercede, when we allow God to have it, uh, amazing things can happen. Uh, and I'm I'm a uh, I'm a witness. I, I mean, I've seen it firsthand in in every and and when we think about the hardest circumstances of our lives, where mm. we choose forgiveness, every other circumstance around forgiveness becomes easier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I've been amazed at how many people are bound bound up and caught up in unforgiveness. Oh, uh, we we I mean, I was that way, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it's. When, when, when I made the choice in 2009, it freed me from the depression I was suffering with. And when I say suffering, I'm talking every day. She heard from me. Mm -hmm. I don't want to live. I hope this is the day I die. Mm -hmm. And she heard that from me every single day for the first 23 years of our marriage. JT, how has uh, God used you in the prison ministry? Yeah, uh, it's Terry Lee and I both have a role in it. We, yeah. um, we, we go into the local jail in Franklin County, uh, three days a week. Uh, right now we're, we're, we've been out for the last, uh, four or five weeks because of a COVID outbreak at that jail. Um, we, there's a, another jurisdiction just to our South and we've been there a couple times, uh, right now, again, we're isolated out of there because of a COVID outbreak. And we've just been invited to uh, minister at, um, a state prison, uh, about an hour away from where we live. Uh, and we're going through the uh, review process on that. And, and it's interesting because my view of people who were incarcerated, that's one of the things, if I can say this right, and I hope people will understand what I'm saying. Uh, it was one aspect of, uh, of individuals that helped me feel better about myself. I used to look down on people who were incarcerated and think to myself, well, at least I'm not that bad. Uh, at least I haven't uh, got a, uh, a felony conviction. At least I'm not doing those things. And it would help me feel just a little bit better about it. So isn't it funny how God took the very people that I used to look down my nose at, and they're the people I'm there to serve. And I spend, uh, we go to, like I said, the Franklin County Jail. We, we're part of a program called Bridging the Gap. And we deliver a Bible study three days a week, two hours a day. And then we provide some support 
to select individuals who, when they get released, they, they come, there's a whole group of us that are involved and, and I'm, uh, so I don't want to single us out, but there's a few folks from that program when they graduate and get released uh, that, that look to us to provide um, support to them. We do some support and encouragement to their families, yes. uh, spouses, yeah, girlfriends, whatnot um, during the time while they're um, imprisoned. And and the same thing, there's an addiction center in uh, about an hour and 15 minutes from us uh, down in, in uh, Henry County called Axton, Virginia. It's called the Hope Center. The Hope Center is a national, I think there's even some international facilities that are, they're called Hope Centers. Uh, and I get to go there and, and that's the key word. I get to go. I don't have to go. I get to go. Yeah. I get to go uh, do a Bible study on Friday mornings at 7 a.m. Uh, I get to uh, go to facilities and pick up individuals who are being admitted there, uh, accepted into the program. And I transport them from regional and, and j uh, local jails to, to that facility. And I get to continue in, in the first phase, the first 45 days of their program, ministering to them. And it's just, uh, uh, I don't know, it's, it's, again, nothing I could have ever imagined I would have been a part of. Uh, and it's just shown, showing me how God can use any of us uh, in, in, in his work. And the very populations that are described in the least of these, uh, the sick and infirmed and the hungry and the, uh, those without clothes and, and those that are incarcerated, all of those populations are the, the populations that God has called us to. Uh, and so it's, um, it, it's, again, it's just it, humbling. Boots on the ground, boots on the ground. Lest I forget, anyone <clears throat> that's watching, that will watch, if you are interested in having JT and Terry Lee come to your group, your organization, your church, contact them. They're easy to contact. Just go to mybrotherscrossing.org, and there you can leave them a message. Uh, all their information's right there. And I would encourage pastors, group leaders, uh, everyone and anyone, number one, get the book and get the DVD. And then nudge somebody, a pastor, a group leader, a youth leader, wh whomever, and say, look, we need these people to come and minister to us. You guys show show the movie uh, when you go places. Yeah. If if that's part of what they asked for, absolutely. We we've been to Ed's church. We went to Ed's uh, church up in Ohio back in uh, July of 2020, and then uh, they invited us back in February of last year, and we were up there for four days. And um, you know, people. The two questions we get asked. First of, first of all, the thing that just uh, affirms that God's in this, we never called and asked one place, can we come? Mm -hmm. And for six years, that's all we've been doing. Every weekend, we're somewhere. Uh, and, and the two questions that we uh, get asked, uh, one is, how many people do you have to have in order to make the trip? Uh, and then how much do you charge? And the answer to the first question is, we'll come for one. Uh, our ministry, uh, the, the, the the way we've framed it is we're a ministry of the one being Jesus Christ for the one. We'll come for one. And we don't charge anything. We don't ask for anything. If if something's offered, we certainly accept it. Uh, but it's not about the money. It's all about pointing people to Christ. And we want to be authentic. We want to be real. We want to be genuine. Uh, I remember, Ed, uh, when we were up there the first time, Ed, we were sitting in the Mexican restaurant before we headed back. Uh, to Virginia. And, and Ed looked at me and says, JT, how are you able to stay humble through all of this? And and the, the, the easy way for me to answer that question is, but God, none of this happens, but God. Mm -hmm. uh, I wasn't looking for it. I, I wasn't trained in it. Uh, my brother pursued this with his life. This just landed on top of us. And, and so I, I have nothing to point to but him. I've got to trust him for everything. And, and so that, that's one, one easy way to say, I saw my friend, my brother, Dave Schuler put the comment up there, but God, and, mm -hmm. uh, and that's, that's so much of, of what, how we walk this thing out. 
I'm reminded of the old rugged cross. Mm. And JT, <clears throat> I, I, I think you and I was talking, I, I talked with somebody. Uh, dear Lord, please don't let me lose my sensitivity mm. to the old rugged cross. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. I go back to the old rugged cross every day. Mm. Every day. And I'm not blowing my horn, tooting my whistle. Mm -hmm. But here's one of the things that I've made a habit to do when I go back mm -hmm. and I kneel before that cross. I ask the Lord, Lord, if there's any ego in me today, stifle it. The second thing I do is, Father, and this is how I pray. Set a watch at my big mouth. That's literally what I say. Father, set a watch at my big mouth. And may what I say bring glory and honor to you. That's what it's all about. The old Amen. cross. Because without the cross, there's nothing. 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 Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, friends, Romans and countrymen, my, oh, my, a sweet, sweet presence in this place. And I'm so glad that we could be a part of it. And so glad you were, too. Once again, please share us out there. Push it out there. Tell your friends, your family, your neighbors, your co-workers. And take time to go to mybrotherscrossing.org and please get the book, get the DVD, and then nudge somebody and say, we're going to have these folks come and minister to us. Because all the glory goes to God. God has exalted him. Remember that. Exalted him and given him a name. Which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus. Isn't that sweet? The name of Jesus. Sometimes I'll sit right out here in my little studio. And I'll just sit here and I'll just say, Jesus. Isn't that, isn't that so sweet? Sweet just to be able to call his name mm. and not only call his name, but he answers you. He knows. Amen. You. Yes. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Absolutely. Please do all these things for us. I trust and pray that we were a blessing to you tonight. God bless you, Terry Lee and JT. God bless you, Ed. We'll be back Thursday night with Frank Harbor. Oh, you'll love Frank. You will love mm. Frank. He is a whole bunch of everything, but he's a man that loves God, and he's on a mission. He'll be with us Thursday night at 730, so tune in again. And so until next time, we'll see you later, everybody. Good night.